You know, I remember seeing Justin Bieber and, and singer Kalani going at each other on social media over who had the last R&B album to hit number one on the Billboard charts. And I'm like, they don't even do R&B music. They do pop music. <sighs> I, I just don't get it. Why would the music industry get rid of the R&B music genre? I mean, don't get me wrong, right? I love hip hop. It's the number one selling genre right now. But when you're chilling with your girl, you're going to turn on some real old school, smooth R&B soul music to get the mood right. What happened to R&B music, man? Huh? Millions of babies was made off R&B music. And that whole category just disappeared out, out of nowhere, man. Anyway, soul music just, just bring back so many memories, man. When mama and daddy used to play music all day and all night while they's playing cards, drinking, smoking, cooking. All your cousins is at your house. The good old days. But um, this episode, right, I want to talk about the great female R&B trios. And it's really hard to pick who had the best voices when it comes to harmonizing and blending it all together to make that beautiful, perfect sound. Because all music was good back then. I mean, R&B music has produced some of the greatest female groups to ever step on stage. Of course, you had... The Supremes, The Emotions, SWV, LaBelle, The Three Degrees, TLC, J, oh, J was my girls, Brownstones, uh, Black, 702, Toto, Corner Sisters, Honeycomb, The Ronettes. I even think 3LW had a great sound as a trio. It was, and it's many more moking stuff. It's a lot. It's a lot more. But one group, and they were real blood sisters, could sing and make their voices sound like one. And that's the Jones girls. They was beautiful. They had the voices, and they had the talent. Let's get into the story right now. The Jones girls. Starting from the oldest, which was Shirley, was born on September 22nd, 1953. Brenda was born December 7th, 1954. And Valerie was born April 17th, 1956 in Detroit, Michigan. Now, growing up in Detroit, of course, their music idols were Diana Ross and the Supremes and that whole Motown sound with Barry Gordy. But a big influence on them was their mother, who was also a singer, and she was also the choir director for their church. And once she realized her three daughters could harmonize, she started working with them every day, training their voices. And they started singing background for her because back in the 1950s, she had a record deal with RCA Records. She was actually the first black gospel singer on RCA Records to sign. The same day she signed her contract, Little Richard signed his contract with RCA Records. Now, their mother, Mary Frazier Jones, she had a beautiful voice, man. If y'all go to YouTube, she did a version of the song, Put a Little Love in Your Heart, with the Jones girls singing in the background when they was real young. That's on YouTube. Y'all can check that out. Now, their mother kept them busy rehearsing every day to keep them out of trouble and away from the bad boys. That's when she started taking them all around Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, singing and performing with her, calling themselves Mary Fraser Jones and the Jones Sisters. And a couple of known gospel groups they performed with during that time was the Winans and the Clark sisters. Now, in their early teens, around 12 or 13 years old, that's when they started listening to more secular music and they met a lady who had a recording studio and a record label. 
and she had asked their mother if she could record a couple of R&B songs with them. Now, once they started recording with her and got a little buzz around the city, they ended up meeting a guy named McKinley Jackson who loved their voices and he wanted to bring them to meet Holland Dozier Holland. Now, for those who don't know who they are, they were responsible for all the Motown hits like The Supremes, Where Did I Love Go, Baby Love, The Four Tops, Sugar Pie, Honey Bunch, Martha and the Vandellas, and the list goes on. Because see, when Holland Doja and Holland had left Motown after having a fallout with Barry Gordy about money, they started their own record labels called Invictus Records and Hot Wax Records. And they needed some background singers for their new artists, Frida Payne and Honeycomb. Now, while they were doing background, they did drop their own singles like um, Come Back, You're the Only Bargain I've Got, Your Love Controls Me, and Taster of the Honey, which was released on Music Merchant Records. After that, they ended up meeting um, Curtis Mayfield, who loved the way they sound after... They was doing some background for the impressions. That's the group Curtis Mayfield was in. And Curtis Mayfield ended up signing them to his label called Kurt Tom Records. And they released the singles with him called uh, If You Don't Love Me No More and Will You Be There, which really didn't make any noise on the charts. They had a whole album with Curtis Mayfield, but he never put it out. But... Everybody in the industry still wanted them to sing and harmonize on their songs and they continue to do background for artists like Aretha Franklin, Tower of Power, Betty Everett, and many more. That's when their manager told them that Diana Ross needed some backup singers for her London tour and asked them to audition for her. Now, when Diana Ross heard them harmonize, she was blown away and hired them right on the spot as her backup singers. But see, when they got with Diana, Diana Ross knew that they was too good to stay backup singers. And it was only a matter of time before someone offered them a record deal. And she was right because Gamble and Huff was at her show in Philly looking for a female uh, vocal group because they had just had a falling out with their um, girl group called The Sweethearts. Now, y'all probably know Gamble and Huff from their record label called PIR, Philadelphia International Records, better known as the Philly Soul Sound. And they, I mean, you know, they had artists like the OJs, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, Teddy P, Billy Paul, Lou Rawls, Patti LaBelle, and many more. And when they were at Diana Ross's um, show in Philly, they paid more attention to the Jones sisters' background vocals than Diana Ross singing on stage. But, you know, Diana Ross used to let them sing while she would go backstage and, and change clothes. After the show, Gamble and Huff offered them a contract to sign to their label. And once they signed, he changed their names from the Jones sisters to the Jones girls. Now, when they got with Gamble and Huff, they were still doing a lot of backup singing until their time finally came. And in early 1979, they released their self-titled debut album with the singles, You're Gonna Make Me Love Somebody Else, which hit number five on the Soul Singles chart, number 12 on the Disco chart, and number 38 on the Billboard Hot 100, selling over a million copies, pushing the album to certified gold. And I remember Jay-Z, um, he sampled that song for his um, for the song The City Is Mine featuring Blackstreet on the In My Lifetime Volume 1 album. I used to pump that junk all the time. But um, look, the Jones Girls, that album, that debut album, straight classic. It also had the song Who Can I Run To? And hey... I love I love the group Escape version too, but they couldn't do it like the Jones girls though. They they that was a hit. But the song I really loved the most off that album, my favorite song was uh This Feeling's Killing Me. 
that's my junk right there brenda i think brenda sung lead on that she did a thing on that one now in 1980 they released their second album titled at peace with women which did hit number seven on the top soul album charts and the single dance turned into romance reached number 22 on the u.s soul charts but the single that did it for that album was i just love the man which reached number nine on the u.s soul charts hey who remember the group everyday emotions remaking that song for the house party three movie soundtrack Y'all remember at the end when Kid finally got married and they was playing that song at the end and Bernie Mac kept kissing on that stripper saying, who you with? Yeah, I gotta watch that movie now. House Party 3. Yeah, but that song, I Just Love the Man, probably was the highest charting song off that album. Now, the following year, in 1981, they released their third album titled Get As Much Love As You Can with the singles I found that man of mine and Nights Over Egypt, in which is one of everybody's favorite songs. And I love the Nights Over Egypt beat, man. Especially when that beat come on. I might have to sample that beat. Now, after that album, the Jones Girls and Gambling Huff didn't see eye to eye on the money side of things, and the record label was going through some problems. Plus, their contract was up, so they decided to leave and sign with RCA and they released the album title On Target. Now, that album, On Target, that was a whole different sound from what people were used to hearing from them. And they had worked with uh, Luther Vandross, writer of uh, Fonzie Thornton on that album. But the album really didn't make any noise on the charts because Gamble and Huff, all that unreleased material he had of them, they ended up releasing the album at the same time. And I think the album was titled uh, Keep It Coming. They released that album at the same time, which might have confused the fans a little bit. The crazy part is the album Gamble and Huff released sold more than the new album they released on RCA Records. Now, after that, they all decided to take a break. Brenda ended up moving to Atlanta and Valerie decided to go to college. And that's when Shirley got back with Gamble and Huff to do a solo album. And she released it in 1986 titled Always in the Mood with the singles Do You Get Enough Love, which hit number one on the U.S. R&B charts for two weeks. And that was a good album, too. And it was really big overseas. Y'all make sure y'all go download and stream that album, Always in the Mood. You might have to buy it on vinyl, though, or get the CD. They may have it on um, Amazon or Spotify by now, though. But anyway, now, after that, Gamble and Huff called it quits with their record label. And the Jones girls just went on with their regular lives. And even though Shirley got married to Harlem Globetrotters uh, basketball player Harold Hubbard, she continued to perform and do music. Brenda still performed as well singing with a live band doing jazz and R&B. And around 1992, they all got back together and released the album titled Coming Back over in the UK, working with um, Soul to Soul producer Jazzy B. But check this right now. Um, as I'm doing my research, I came across a book called uh, Last Shop Standing, Whatever Happened to Record Shops, written by Graham Jones. Now, Graham Jones said him and a guy named Steve Kersley helped with organizing a tour for the Jones girls in the UK. Like I said, they was big over there in the UK. But see, now Graham Jones in his book, he called the Jones girls the most dysfunctional group in soul music at the time. And he's saying some wild stuff like um, they was always when, when he was dealing with them over in the UK, they was always fighting with each other. Um, Brenda had a drinking problem, Valerie had a pill problem, but he didn't really say anything bad about Shirley because she was the focus when he said. But you know, all family go through things, man. And plus, they was dealing with the industry, man. Who knows what they had to go through? And I know one thing. Over in the UK, the fans loved the Jones girls. Now, after that, 
Shirley dropped another album in 1994 called With You and the sisters thought about getting back together again to do another album. But on December 2nd, 2001, the baby sister of the group, Valerie Jones, died from unknown causes. But some say she suffered from alcoholism and depression. I don't know. We have to wait for the, the unsung episode coming out. Now, she was 45 years old. R.I.P. Valerie Jones. Now, after Valerie passed away, the family took it real hard, but Shirley kept doing music while Brenda spent most of her time with her granddaughter while she was a traveling nurse taking care of her granddaughter. Plus, she helped raise Valerie's son after she passed. And in 2013, Brenda ended up homeless for a short period, but bounced back on her feet after a friend helped her out and moved her from a shelter to a hotel and then later to a new home with her daughter and granddaughter. And she did put out a record over there in London that did pretty good on the soul charts. But then more tragedy hit the family on April 3rd, 2017. Brenda Jones was killed after being hit by several cars while attempting to cross the street while visiting her daughter in Wilmington, Delaware. That is sad, man. It's terrible. She was 62 years old. R.I.P. Brenda Jones. And you know, man, today Shirley Jones is still doing it and looking good. She's still doing a lot of interviews on YouTube. Y'all can check out. She's still going strong, keeping the um, Jones girl's name alive. And I think she um doing music with her son and her nephew now. I know she said in one of the interviews she was supposed to do another version of the song, Who Can I Run To? Y'all make sure y'all go support Shirley and the rest of the family and stream and download all their music and check her out on social media. And like I said earlier, Shirley Jones did mention that this story is going to be on the new season of Unsung. So I can't wait to see that so we can get the real story about the Jones girls. Or she might put out a book. Yeah, Shirley Jones should put out a book too. A movie would be great too about their lives. So y'all just stay tuned for more episodes. And I appreciate all the fans supporting and everything.